Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual in Investor Forum. We're very glad to see so many of you joining us tonight. I'm Pauline from SIAS, and I am the MC for this session. The Investor Forum is the last event of the week-long Corporate Governance Week 2022 program, which started from 7 October until today, 14 October. In line with the Corporate Governance Week team, advancing corporate governance in an age of disruptions, Tonight, today's forum will discuss the topic, Does ESG Help to Improve Shareholder Value? Before we start, please note that if you have any questions, you may use the Zoom Q&A function and our panel will endeavour to answer them during the panel discussion. Without further delay, it is my pleasure now to invite our esteemed guest speaker to start the session with a presentation. Dr. David Smith. Senior Investor Director at the team. Dr. Smith, please. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline, and good evening, good morning to everyone who is here. First of all, many thanks to CS for uh, inviting me to speak and be part of this uh, panel this evening, uh, and I look forward to attending these physical events uh, in the future. I'll speak a little bit around uh, the value that ESG can add in terms of shareholder value, uh, some of the philosophy behind it, some of the studies that would support some of this, then also some of the challenges around realizing uh, this value. In terms of the philosophical construct, uh, for many of us who operate within the industry, it would be intuitive that ESG helps to improve shareholder value, but I want to dive into a little bit why. I think if you are a, if you're an investor, uh, with the long-term uh, mindset or anyone who invests beyond the time period uh, of a couple of days or a couple of months, then the value that we derive from the company tends to be uh, the present value of a, of a number of cash flows that we discount back into the, into the present. Those cash flows, the further you go out, tend to be increasingly influenced by uh, factors that we, we loosely ascribe to, uh, to ESG. Uh, whether they are around environmental issues or social issues or political issues or regulatory issues. And more importantly, the way that uh, companies can navigate these changing, uh, changing horizons. As investors, we operate in complex uh, and changing worlds. And most investors, whilst we claim to know the future, uh, don't know the future. And for any investor who tells you that they do know the future, uh, you should run quite far. What we can do though, uh, is look to identify and invest in companies who are high quality uh, and that have uh, what I would call high levels of resilience within this complex world. And again, much of that would fall into uh, what, we, what we call ESG. If we think about resilience, what we want to understand is the way that a company is able to navigate these changes or these shifts in their own operating environment. We want to identify companies that have uh, long-term uh, strategic focus and ability to execute that strategy. When we think about that resilience, we tend to divide that into two, uh, into two factors, one uh, around endogenous uh, factors and one around exogenous factors. And what do I mean by that? When you look to invest in a high-quality company, when you want to understand the quality of ESG, when you want to understand the way that that may impact cash flows, we want to understand the resilience of the business model and the resilience of the business to withstand changes in the operating environment and also changes around regulation and changes around the way the company is perceived uh, by its consumers. And so much of this falls into ESG, but we ask ourselves, does this company succeed uh, by ripping off uh, customers that may have no choice but to go with the company? Could another competitor provide a similar service, but at a lower cost, but currently are unable to because of some kind of regulations? Uh, is a business model uh, down to regulatory arbitrage, moving from one regulatory environment to another to succeed uh, in a way that's simply not sustainable if uh, regulations change? Uh, does the business exist and succeed because of poorly priced uh, externalities or inputs? Uh, uh, in the way that we've seen carbon taxes now close those uh, or approach closing those poorly priced externalities or poorly priced inputs. And so they survive based on uh, labor that is, uh, that is mispriced 
or contractual workers in a way that, that is exploiting some kind of regulatory uh, loophole, for example, is the business model uh, predicated on, on a low interest rate, for example, or some kind of cost of capital arbitrage, or is the company effectively a regulated monopoly? What we're really trying to understand is whether the business is able to navigate changes in these uh, operating environments. When we talk about endogenous shocks, uh, these would tend to be around changes in employee turnover, changes in the way the company manages its supply chain, uh, uh, susceptibility to poor management or poor board of directors, for example. And so what we want to understand is the way that the company can navigate these changes. Uh, does the company control its own inputs? Does the company control its own water supply? Does the company manage its water risk? Uh, does the company have good labor standards? Does the company have good relations with labor, for example? Does the company pay a fair wage bill? All of which can change, or all of which can be identified and regulated by regulators once uh, perception uh, and that operating environment changes. And so the further you go out into the future as you discount these cash flows uh, as you pay for the company, the more the ability of the company to navigate these changes is important to the business in order for us to, as investors to realize these cash flows. And so coming back to my earlier comments, uh, it should be intuitive that for an investor with a long-term uh, horizon, ESG should be important to incorporate as part of an investment analysis uh, process. And also it should be intuitive that ESG helps to improve shareholder value. And so whilst I won't make this presentation about Aberdeen, uh, what I will say is that we believe that ESG factors are financially material uh, and do impact company valuations. We do believe that factors around changes in regulation, social trends, climate change, influence the profitability of sectors and of companies. And that by understanding ESG and incorporating ESG and identifying companies with high quality ESG, that gives us an insight into the overall quality of management and the sustainability of a business over the long term. So it should be intuitive through that construct around the way that ESG adds value to the business and also adds value to us as investors. I'll talk a little bit around some evidence that would support that over the next slides. If we can move to the next slide, please. One more slide, please. And so what you can see here uh, are a number of studies that we've pulled together that, that uh, include some kind of evidence for uh, uh, share price uh, performance uh, and cost of capital uh, for companies that have high quality uh, ESG. You can see on the left uh, uh, from some research that high quality companies with a higher quality score in terms of ESG, and I think ESG scoring will come up later in the panel, uh, tend to trade at a premium to companies that have lower quality ESG. And there's some volatility around that premium, but you can see they generally trade at a premium as investors are willing to pay more for companies that have uh, a, a greater ability to realize those long-term cash flows. High quality companies, so companies that score well for ESG tend to have lower borrowing costs. Uh, and what we've also seen is that high quality companies or funds that invest in high quality ESG companies have attracted a lot of investor interest and we've seen ESG flows into those companies uh, accelerate over the last few years. And obviously that's had an impact on valuation uh, in, in many cases for companies that are demonstrably green or demonstrably high quality in terms of their ESG score. If we could move to the next slide, please. Just on the cost of capital point, this is something that has uh, been a primary focus of attention for researchers who look to understand the correlation between the operating performance of the company uh, and uh, high quality ESG. So this is some more research that plots that link between ESG quality uh, and cost of capital, cost of equity, and cost of, uh, breaking that into cost of uh, uh, debt and cost of equity. You can see here, there's a very clear relationship between quality and ESG, uh, whereby higher quality companies tend to have uh, a lower cost of capital. And what's really interesting is that that uh, difference between high and low quality uh, and borrowing costs or cost of capital costs uh, is more marked in emerging markets, which tend to be more inefficient markets with high levels of information asymmetry and also high levels of uh, uh, perception asymmetry around quality of ESG. Uh, so these companies tend to have lower costs of capital associated with higher quality ESG. And obviously that's important for uh, ongoing operating uh, performance if you have lower quality debt, uh, lower cost of debt, and also more interesting for valuations to investor if you have a lower cost of capital. We can move on to the next slide, please. 
The next point uh, really is around that link between share price performance uh, and ESG. And so whilst what I discussed earlier is around the link between ESG and operating performance, uh, primarily around cost of capital. Uh, what's interesting now is around the link between ESG and share price performance, which is what as investors were interested in here. This was a study done by MSCI a few years ago that divided companies into quintiles in terms of high, low quality ESG uh, and tracked the share price performance of those companies that are divided into the quintiles. And you can see there's a very clear difference in terms of performance over a 10 year period, whereby the highest quality companies as defined by those in the fifth quintile, so the Q5 companies, uh, have materially outperformed those with lower ratings. And why this is interesting, this is a 10 year uh, performance study. So it is a cross uh, periods in terms of uh, market cycles. Uh, so a 10 year time series, you can see that the high quality companies have outperformed those with the lower ratings. Uh, what's curious is that the second quintile, uh, the Q2 companies perform the worst. I don't know why they would perform worse than Q1, uh, but they do. Uh, but over a long time period, you can see that higher quality companies outperform lower quality companies. And that should be intuitive, that higher quality companies have more persistence of their competitive advantage. And so over time, they should be more favored by investors. And so over time, their shares uh, should do better than those of their lower quality companies. Now there are some short-term uh, disruptions uh, or some short-term volatility around this correlation, but this is one of the uh, uh, main areas of study for, for academic and investment practitioners alike, uh, and is one of the areas of study that tends to find uh, some uh, persistence of that correlation between high quality ESG and, and share price performance. If we could move to the next slide, please. There was another study that I would talk about uh, that I would put together uh, that was a meta study a few years ago by NYU uh, in the US that surveyed uh, over a thousand papers from 2015 to 2020 that examined that relationship between ESG and financial performance. And the, the study was interesting because it looked at the link between ESG and operating performance, so corporate financial performance, and also the link between ESG and investment performance. And these are two uh, uh, related but distinct fields of research, and this was a survey that covered both. And the survey found that across those thousand uh, 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 pieces of research, there was a positive relationship between ESG and financial performance for almost 60% uh, of the studies around corporates that focused on metrics, including ROE, ROA, or stock price, for example, uh, and almost 60% of investment studies, so focusing on stock prices, uh, showed similar or better performance relative to conventional investment approaches, uh, typically focusing on uh, alpha or, or sharp ratio. And so a very large survey uh, of academic literature uh, that examined this correlation between ESG and corporate financial performance uh, and stock price performance, uh, almost two thirds of the studies uh, found some degree of uh, positive correlation. When it comes to the, the link between ESG and share price performance, typically uh, uh, findings tend to fall into one of two buckets. One is around uh, high quality companies having uh, uh, superior returns over a given time period, potentially as part of a study. Uh, the other is uh, around high quality companies maybe having similar returns, but lower risk. Both, the, uh, both of these outcomes are, are interesting to us as, as investors, uh, if, you can, if you can have similar outcomes, but for, for lower risk. Uh, some summaries uh, on the right in terms of some of the main takeaways for this, uh, the papers concluded that improved financial performance uh, due to ESG becomes more noticeable over longer time periods, and that, that's consistent with my opening comments around uh, long-term investors uh, paying more attention to ESG. Uh, ESG integration as an investment strategy performs better than screening, and I'll touch on integration uh, later, but that should be uh, intuitive for investors who want to maximize alpha from ESG rather than minimize uh, risk. Uh, ESG investing uh, provides downside protection, especially during a social or economic crisis. Uh, we've seen this time and again with a number of crises that higher quality companies tend to have lower volatility during these uh, 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 drawdowns. Uh, sustainability at corporates tends to drive better financial performance uh, uh, around risk management and innovation. Uh, some studies showing that managing for low carbon future improves final performance. 
Uh, and most importantly, that ESG disclosure on its own doesn't drive financial performance. And this is really important, and we'll touch on this in the panel, but disclosure alone is not related to financial performance. Uh, and when you look beyond what that statement is saying, that is statement is saying that we need to go beyond what's disclosed. We should not take at face value what's disclosed. Effectively, be wary of greenwashing and look at what companies are, are really doing. If we could move to the next slide, please. But uh, uh, as I've said here, uh, it's not that easy. Uh, if we could move on, please. Whilst there are uh, studies and research that would suggest that there is a good correlation uh, between ESG and corporate financial performance and stock price uh, uh, performance, the fact uh, that uh, 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 those factors are still uh, uh, financially, both financially material and interesting uh, to us as investors, suggests that the market is somewhat inefficient when it comes around to ESG uh, and is reflective of some of the challenges for investors when integrating ESG into their investment process. And I've separated it into the four Ds because that's easy for me to remember. First of all, disclosure uh, is often poor. Uh, it's often challenging as investors to really understand the quality of companies that we're assessing when disclosure around ESG is not where we'd want it to be. That's certainly true. Uh, of emerging markets, that's certainly true of some markets in Asia, although that's improving a lot. The challenge is, as an investor, how can you assure yourself that companies have high quality ESG? And that's not just because disclosure is poor or lacking, but also where disclosure is overwhelming and there's a risk of greenwashing. Due diligence is also complicated when you're investing, uh, when you're researching companies, uh, particularly in, in a region like Asia. Uh, complex supply chains, complex regulations, complex uh, social contexts, complex ownership structures mean that due diligence is really important to not only understand the quality of ESG, but also to avoid adverse impacts. And so again, it's going beyond the narrative, going beyond the annual report, going beyond simply a meeting with management to really do quite deep due diligence to understand both the positive characteristics, but also the potential negative or adverse impacts that a company uh, might be having. Might be having. Uh, the depth of research is also important as well. Uh, and this is a, a key barrier or key hurdle, I think, to the widespread adoption of, of ESG integration across capital markets. And that's really the specialization of research that, that's required beyond uh, conventional financial analysis. And so we've seen uh, a lot of capacity uh, being added into the ESG space, the capital markets uh, space, particularly in Asia when it comes to ESG. Uh, and that's a reflection of the depth of research that's required in order to integrate ESG. Uh, not everyone has this uh, uh, depth of research available. And so that's one structural hurdle uh, to, uh, uh, to understanding and integrating ESG. And that's related to the, to the fourth challenge around duration. Uh, ESG investing requires patience and a long-term mindset. Uh, as I said, there may be short-term dislocations between uh, that relationship between ESG and quality. Uh, over time, uh, uh, research shows we strongly believe that there is a long-term correlation between ESG quality and, and stock price returns, and that over time, this quality uh, uh, shines through, but in the short term, there can be dislocations. And so generally we've found that uh, uh, not everyone has the capacity to integrate ESG, not everyone has the capability as part of the investment process to integrate ESG, not everyone has the ability to integrate from a time horizon perspective. And that's why the markets are still relatively inefficient when it comes to pricing ESG. If we could move to the, the next slide, please. And so what I've set out here is a little bit of a, uh, a schematic about the way we can think about ESG integration in the investment process. What we've seen recently is a lot of capacity addition in terms of headcount uh, focused on uh, ESG analysis. But in order to capture the alpha or generate alpha from ESG, it's important that investors consider the investment process itself as being structured in a way to, 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 to integrate ESG. And so a lot of the ESG analysis comes either at the portfolio construction stage or the engagement stage uh, uh, in, in the investment community. And that's not necessarily the way to capture alpha. But we believe that the later on in the investment process, ESG is integrated 
the more the focus will be on downside protection uh, or risk mitigation. The earlier on you integrate ESG into the investment process, the more likely you are to be able to capture alpha by identifying companies uh, who have the resilience that I was speaking to earlier. And so uh, investors need to understand the way that sector dynamics are at play, the way that sectors will evolve. We use what we call uh, a review, a sector review, which is effectively a roadmap for the way a sector may evolve over the next three to five years. What are the fundamental drivers of risk and return? What are the ESG drivers of uh, risk and return? What are the dynamics at play? What are some of the, the, the macro or thematic factors that might drive return, but also present uh, risk to companies through their operating environment? And from that, uh, how do you generate ideas? What kind of uh, interesting opportunities should you be looking at as a, as a fund manager? From there, you think about research, you integrate that into your research on companies, you integrate that into the way that you discuss these issues with management. So again, uh, before the uh, investment stage, before the portfolio construction stage, through portfolio construction, integrating ESG into the way that you size positions, uh, for example, uh, and then from engagement, understanding what these drivers of uh, ESG risk and opportunity are, and then continuing that conversation with management teams uh, uh, to understand the way that they're navigating these, uh, these changes in the operating environment. And so this is challenging in terms of reorienting the investment process in order to capture alpha, uh, but it's important uh, to do so in a way that allows investment managers to fully integrate ESG. And so to summarize, uh, as I said earlier, uh, as investment managers, we operate in increasingly complex world, an increasingly volatile world. We invest in a way that uh, uh, values companies based on some kind of uh, cash flow discounted to, to present value, uh, and those cash flows are at risk uh, uh, as a result of this complex operating environment. The further out to the future you go, the more these cash flows are impacted by what is called ESG, but ultimately what is uh, uh, uncertainty in the endogenous and exogenous operating environments. And that's why as investors, it's important to focus on ESG uh, as part of the investment process. There's a growing body of literature that will support that, that, uh, 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 that relationship between quality and ESG. But as investment managers, it should be intuitive that if you're investing for the long term, that it should be important to integrate ESG given the value it can add to, you, to the company, but also to, to you as an investor. And so I think I will end there. Uh, hand back to Elaine, uh, and then we can go to the panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David Sweeney. Um, please stay on screen while we invite um, the moderator and the rest of the panelists to join us on screen. So with us tonight, um, we have Mrs. Elaine, honorary advisor, sales and independent director, uh, who's the moderator. And together with us, we have the panelists, Mr. Ang Hong Yao, honorary secretary, sales, and private investor, Ms. Emily Go, committee member here, and CEO 3S Asset Management. And joining us all the way from UK, Dr. Roger Barker, Director of Policy and Corporate Governance, Institute of Director IOD Risk. Over to you, please, Mr. James. Thank you very much, Polly. Well, good evening, everyone, and good morning for those who are calling in and, and joining us from overseas, especially you, Roger. And David, thank you very much for your most insightful presentation. Now, capital markets today are in the midst of sea change. Many of us have had to learn a whole new vocabulary that are green-centric. And we also have to embrace new sustainability reporting standards. We've just heard from David that institutional investors are now walking the green talk and they probe companies on their sustainability challenges, policies and practices. And many of these funds and institutions vote to reflect their climate related concerns. Indeed, according to a recent McKinsey report, inflows into sustainable funds have jumped from US $5 billion in 2018 to US $2.5 trillion by the middle of this year. 
Now, against this backdrop of the green, what I call the green revolution, it's my pleasure to invite our panelists to share their comments, and then we will circle back to you, David. So first, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Ang Hawiao, Honorary Secretary SIAS, Chairman Credit Counseling Singapore, and in his own right, a successful private investor to give his comments. Hawiao, over to you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, well, given that I'm a retail investor in the retail investor body, I think I should um, talk a little bit about uh, ESG uh, from the eyes of a retail investor. Um, Firstly, should retail investors even bother about ESG? You know, or can they go about their usual method of stock selection using financial statements and the annual report? It is just a feel good goal or is going through the thick sustainability report every year worth the effort? Bearing in mind, some of these reports are comparable in size to the annual report. But I think they have no choice but to keep up with the trends in the ESG space. Um, you have heard from Dr. Smith and other investors, especially big fund managers, they're all involved in this space. And Elaine has also mentioned, there are fund managers with dedicated ESG team and they use ESG filters in their investment processes. Dr. Smith has also shown that firms with higher ESG score can perform better in terms of share price. I saw an ad by a large fund manager recently, which not only promotes better performance from investing in sustainable companies, but touts that a 1 million US dollar invested in the fund generates less, as in a reduced, 33 tons of CO2 emissions. So doing good well while doing good. Even in Singapore, trusts are also getting into the picture. Keppel Infrastructure Trust, for example, recently said it is targeting to triple their portfolio to $18 billion through opportunities in the renewable energy and logistics space, targeting areas like wind assets, desalination and digital infrastructure. So big money are going to this area. If retail investors are not in the game, then we may be left out. I can't guarantee that retail investors can do well and do good with no trade-offs. But one thing I'm quite sure of is that if your investing companies are not catching up with the trends of this sector, they will likely perform poorly over time. So how do we go about this? There are so many areas in environment and sustainability, from emissions to deforestation to waste. How do we navigate this environment? Well, if you invest through fund managers and unit trusts, you may want to engage them on their processes of stock or bond selections and how they factor in ESG. If you invest in individual stocks, then you may want to ask an investor companies if their products are future-proof. I think it's important that um, rather than just relying on ESG scores when you invest, sometimes retail investors can invest directly in companies and you know, go down and kick the tires and challenge the management. For example, market demands are changing. So other companies, moving away from non-recyclable materials. If you invest in a packaging or a drinks company, and there are several on our exchange, you would want to question them on their packaging recyclability and rather than generating more single-use waste. For developers, their green building standards, are they adhering to those? Obtaining BCA green mark, green design and healthy designs and features, where are they in the quest for net zero carbon. Are they reducing carbon usage in their construction materials? Another example, for shipping in 2020, IMO 2020 came to effect, reducing limits on sulfur in fuel oil. So in the years running up to then for your shipping stocks, you would have wanted to ask them the questions on how the company was prepared for this new standard. Are they winding down assets which are not suited for low emissions, low carbon future? Have they secured their low sulfur energy supplies? Now, new rules on car emissions are coming. We are currently on Euro 6. And Euro 7 is expected in the next few years. Something to follow if you have companies who have vehicle fleets. 
Green financing, a lot of money are going in there, green bonds or even government grants. Is the company in a position to tap on those lower costs of capital? Singapore government has grants to promote a green future in the areas of energy efficiency, green buildings, and so on. Are your companies tapping on these? So for an investor, even a retail investor, I think there is no option but to follow the global trends of environment and sustainability. CEO of BlackRock sums it up saying, we focus on sustainability, not because we are environmentalist, but we are capitalist and fiduciaries to our clients. That requires understanding how companies are adjusting their businesses for the massive changes the economy is undergoing. Not to worry, for retail investors, Sias has recently announced we will be reviewing sustainability reports and question companies to make them more accountable. This will put up on our website for shareholders to view. So please make use of this program. Lastly, and we can pick up on this later, critics and uh, Elaine also mentioned something about possibility of greenwashing. I mean, for example, Volkswagen admitted to cheating on an emissions test. So how do we get assurance that companies are doing what they say they're doing? I'll end here. Thank you very much, Hao Yao. I always thought there was only one supreme evangelist for CRS. I can now add Ang Hao Yao to that list. Well, we now look west all the way to London. So it's my pleasure to now ask Dr. Roger Barker, Director of Policy and Corporate Governance, UKIOD, to share some of his comments uh, for us. Roger, over to you. Thank you very much, Elaine. And it's great to see everyone and see us. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I think that the evidence that David presented about the correlation between stock performance and ESG is very compelling. I think we can conclude that there is an ESG premium, which is available um, to stocks that can dem uh, genuinely demonstrate um, you know, good ESG standards. I think and that's hardly surprising given the volume of funds that are flowing in to, to ESG focused uh, fund entities. And, I don't see this stopping anytime soon. I think, you know, the especially the younger generation see responsible business as the way forward. They've kind of turned their backs on the Milton Friedman type approach to business, which saw businesses purely being about maximizing profits. You know, now they want to see businesses with purpose and businesses that are going to have a positive impact on society. Um, but having said that, I think when you go into the ESG arena, you are walking a tightrope. Um, on the one hand, if you try and implement too much, should we say, ESG uh, positive actions, um, then you run the risk that you of being accused of, of greenwashing, um, and that you may come under for doing that and the media and even short sellers um you know i know i noticed that short sellers like muddy waters are now focusing on companies that they view as making exaggerated um green claims and and, and, and adopting a short um selling strategy with them um, and of course also there are some people out there who uh, who are kind of generating a backlash against esg at the moment i mean it's, it's interesting to note that some Republican states in the, in the United States have been divesting from institutional investors like BlackRock because they feel that um, they're, they're too ESG oriented. Um, on the, at the other side of the tightrope, um, if you're not doing enough in terms of ESG, you also face risks as a company um, and as an investor. Um, you know, that we've seen during the current AGM season, um, shareholder resolutions, which have been challenging management in respect of what they're doing in terms of, of ESG. So it's tricky to get it to get it right. Um, the second big, I think, challenge which we face and which David alluded to really is the, the challenge of identifying what is a genuine ESG stock. Um, David presented data using the MSCI ESG indices, but if you look at these various benchmarks of ESG, 
Um, they don't present really a consistent picture. There, there's actually quite a low level of correlation between these, these ESG uh, indices. And it's, I think perhaps this reflects also a lack of clarity of what we're trying to measure in terms of ESG. Now, I noticed that the, the man who caused a lot of controversy um, earlier this year, when he made some quite controversial comments about, about ESG, Stuart Kirk from, from HSBC, he unfortunately lost his, lost his job because of the controversy of, of, of the comments he made. But I think he, he's since made um, quite a valid point, which is that some uh, measures of ESG are trying to measure different things to others. And I think you can distinguish between trying to measure what the impact in terms of ESG will be on the bottom line of a company. Um, so the risk to the company of being exposed to certain ESG factors. And on the other hand, um, what impact the company is having on wider society, what its ultimate impact is going to be on the climate um, and, and sustainability and responsible business more generally. And different measures of ESG are focusing um, differently on these two, uh, two aspects. So that does, uh, I think, make it difficult. Um, we're still in a world where uh, disclosure of ESG uh, factors is, is rather in, inconsistent. There's a lot of work being done on this, on this at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we still have further to go. And I think it will be a positive development when we have bodies like the International Sustainability Standards Board producing more consistent accounting standards, which, which companies can use to disclose and report on, on ESG factors. Um, and especially, I think, when it comes to trying to measure climate change impact, the big elephant in the room is, is trying to measure risk in the supply chain, what, what um, specialists call scope free emissions from companies, um, which are currently not being very well um, disclosed and reported um, by, by man, many companies around the world. So I think, you know, um, ESG undoubtedly is something that any reasonable and responsible uh, company will want to focus on. Um, and want to, will want to achieve, and which any investor will want to get to the bottom of. But there are still real, real challenges in practice in terms of getting to the bottom of this. Thank you very much, Roger. Last but not least, we have our lady on the panel. Uh, Ms. Emily Go, committee member of CIAS and CEO 3S Asset Management to give us her perspective. Emily, over to you, please. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, just a quick introduction. So, so basically, I'm, I'm in fund management and what we do is we invest into agribusinesses. The entire uh, value chain of of uh, food production, uh, processing and, and things like that. So, so ESG is very close to your heart. Okay, what we believe as a practitioner, okay, for all our investee companies, that when we start the business, when we create the business, ESG has to be at the center of it. It doesn't make sense to add in ESG after a while, after we make profits, okay, because we believe that it comes hand in hand, uh, building the business with ESG and making profits at the same time. Okay, for investors, we, we have investors who want to give back to society, okay, and, and, and they are very into ESG. So maybe I can uh, uh, get the slides, please. Okay, so ESG, what, what is ESG? Okay, these, these are, I think by now everybody knows these are what ESG is trying to cover, okay? So environmental okay is waste pollution resource depletion greenhouse deforestation climate change social you'll be how you take care of your labor your employees how how do you train them how what kind of working conditions do you get and 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 how do you build a community around the business all right and, and for governance we are um, operating in countries like malaysia indonesia vietnam philippines so so 
each country has its own set of uh, governance uh, considerations. So, so these are some of the uh, things that we look at when we do our investment, pre-investment. Uh, next slide. Okay, what we follow is basically the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, okay, and there's 17 of them. Okay, so for companies, depending on size, it's, it's not possible to do all 17 and do it well. So what's important for us? We will choose some that we will focus on and we make sure we do it well. All right, so in our investment, uh, in our investment process, there's a pre and post investment. All right, so, so as part of due diligence under the pre-investment, we start with all these ESG policies already. Okay, and post investment, we continue to monitor to make sure each investment, each project continue to follow the guidelines so that we are able to monitor. And when we exit, this is what we can show the new, the new uh, investor. Next. So main part of our ESG is we need to create harmony between the company, the management, the workers, to, to, and, and this will lead to uh, increased productivity, profitability, and equality. Uh, next. This, is, this uh, graph here is very similar to what uh, David showed earlier. Basically, it's saying that uh, companies with ESG elements outperform the index the s p so i think that's the last slide right uh, okay so these these are the uh, areas that we focus on clean energy clean and affordable energy is very important uh, and then uh, eradicating poverty most of the areas we work uh, in are uh, not in the big cities itself right so what we do is we have a program where we get the workers and we share the profit with them and uh, I will have a video later showing you one of our past projects uh, where we, we put this in place. And for environment, this, this particular project of ours, we actually replanted uh, the, the mangrove. It, it's, uh, it's in Indonesia. Uh, the land size is as big as Singapore. Uh, so, so when we uh, started the project, it was a swamp. Okay, We turned it into the world's largest shrimp farm and, uh, and we created a livelihood for 1 million people. Okay, and of course, education is very important, not just for the workers, but for the next generation. So what we do is we provide education, quality education. We provide technology transfer. We train them how to farm. We give them the equipment and, and so that they, have, they can own their own livelihood. Okay, and gender equality. So as part of this ESG, what we are also trying to do is reduce inequality okay not just gender inequality for different classes of uh, of, of people all right providing them jobs equal chances so that they can do what they're good at and everybody has a role and the underprivileged as well okay so so what we do is we will also hire people who are untrained unskilled and then we equip them with what they need to do uh, to have, have a livelihood I, that's the last slide. Are, are you going to show the video? Uh, yeah. I'm... Can I show you now? Yes. Okay. So this video is of our shrimp farm uh, in Lampong. And uh, we have a million people working here. This, this farm was built to uh, solve the transmigration problem. So uh, in the old days, WHO was trying to relocate people, so they gave a loan. And we took this loan and we built a state-of-the-art processing plant. These are the uh, ponds. We built the houses for the people. So that you see the house, one house with two ponds. The people who work there, they own their own house, they own the pond. We provide everything else, including the fry, the, the shrimp fry, uh, the, you know, the, the equipment, and the offtake. So when they grow the shrimp, we buy from them at market price. And in 10 years, we were able to pay back the WHO loan fully with interest. So this is an example of having harmony, working together, and really having ESG principles in the business.
we provide hospital care, we build the schools, is effectively a mini country on its own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Before we swing back to uh, David to uh, add comments to what the panelists have just uh, shared, there is a question from one of our participants uh, directed at Emily in response to what you've just presented. What's the profit yield like on your ESG projects? Would you like to just answer that before we uh, hand over to David? Okay, we have we, we grow different things, right? We we also have vertical indoor high tech farming, so we are looking at about thirty percent gross on that. And for the fish as well, fish and shrimp is higher risk because the cycle is longer, uh, so it's also about uh, twenty over percent. Thank you very much. Over to you, David, for any comments you want to add to what the panelists have just shared. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be extremely brief and, and, and first uh, very uh, much in agreement with Emily around that, that overlap and correlation with the SDGs and uh, uh, much of what we're trying to do as investors. So that was very, uh, very good to see. Uh, just a, a couple of points that I would uh, draw out from Harry and Roger. Certainly Harry uh, hit the nail on the head far more eloquently than I uh, talking about future proofing businesses. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to as an investor. Not doing this uh, because you want to do something good for the environment per se, even if you don't want to, and one would hope that you do, but even if you don't, uh, society changes, economy changes, if you're a packaging company, to Harry R's example, and not looking into circular economy, then it may impact your business. If you're a carbon intensive business and are not aware of carbon taxes, uh, then that's a risk to your business, which ties in with what I was saying about exogenous uh, shocks. And to Roger's point, absolutely agree on uh, the ability to perceive and identify ESG, and in many cases agree on what ESG is, uh, but certainly perceive and uh, identify ESG in certainly many challenges around uh, scoring uh, that, that these third party providers uh, uh, provide to us. And I'm sure that's something that we can dig into on, on the panel. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. We have uh, a few questions that have been posted online. So let's take them, uh, the first one. In order for company to start on the ESG journey, especially on the E and their S, their profit and earnings may be compromised. How long does a company take to fully implement decent ESG practices so that it creates value to shareholders? Anyone like to take on this question? I can start, but with not a very good answer, I'm afraid, uh, uh, that it, it varies from company to company, sector to sector, and, and geography to geography. I think ultimately, as investors, what we focus on is materiality, and I think that's important for companies to do, is to identify the material issues. And so, yeah, it, it may make, take some time, but I think the important point is that it's important for companies to start on that journey, given the, the, the risks and the opportunities around, around ESG. So not a great answer, but uh, shortly, it, it depends. Mm. Yeah, I, I, okay, I, I like the, your your uh, attribute attributing this to materiality. So uh, we'll touch on that later. I saw Roger ready to add comments. Roger, yes, I think um, in in the short term, um, an ESG driven approach may or may not outperform. You know. Um, We've seen, for example, over the last year, I mean, if you, if you want to think what sectors are outperformed in the last 12 months, it's probably been the um, fossil fuel sector. It's been the energy sector that, you know, has been benefiting from global events. Um, but I think here we have to come back to the point that, um, that David was making, that um, if, you're, if you are taking a long-term investment strategy, um, you know, that's where ESG is going to pay off because company is going to be more resilient um, and a higher quality company. You would expect to see uh, much more consistent out, out performance. But in the short term, um, I, you know, the, the market can move in mysterious ways. Well, I, I like the fact that you're the second person who has mentioned resilience. Uh, David actually touched on resilience quite a fair bit in his presentation. So, 
companies who are more resilient, uh, are you saying that companies who are more resilient in their business model, risk management, et cetera, et cetera, are likely to be able to score higher e ESG scores? Um, no, I, I think this issue of uh, resilience, you know, has become an absolutely key issue and it, it really <laughs> from the pand pandemic onwards. Um, we Before the pandemic, we probably were operating with a not particularly res resilient um, global business system. Um, you know, the, the whole notion of having just-in-time supply chains um, where we were seeking the most efficient, uh, low-cost so solution to every business problem was very much valent. A pandemic, I think, has shown us how important uh, resilience is, um, mm -hmm. and that that concern has has continued really now since we've had the um, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the, the the disruption of global energy markets, and now we're moving into a um, a higher inflationary period and, and geopolitical tensions as well, which are which are making globalization you know come come into question. You know, Larry Fink, for example. Has, has uh, the, the the boss of BlackRock has has questioned now the whole notion of globalization. So resilience is key, and I think you know that David is absolutely right that ESG is um, actually one important aspect of of resilience. It's, it's, you know there, there are may, it, probably many components to to what um, creates a resilient company, um, but. Whether they are, you know, an ESG sound company is is a key part of it. Thank you. Yes, uh, how you? Well, I wanted to also chime in on this. You know, whether companies should start on their sustainability journey, and whether you know there's some trade off along the way. I think it's important to communicate this. Um, I I don't think it is necessarily going to be punished by the marketplace. And depending how much trust and goodwill the company has already built up in the marketplace, a bit to your point on resilience, um, you just have to show sincerity, set targets, milestones, update regularly. And I believe that companies, uh, shareholders will reward them by, by you know, a higher share price and by staying with the company. Thank you very much, Hao Yao. Now that was, brings me on to disclosure, which quite a few panelists have uh, highlighted. Uh, challenges of disclosure. It's become mandatory across many markets that companies have to, uh, you know, issue sustainability reports every year. Of course, the reports vary from market to market, industry to industry and company to company. I, I would like to ask the panelists, how comparable are some of these disclosures, considering that many of our uh, standards are still what I consider in their embryoic stage? And if they are not comparable, how reliable are they? Do we accept the integrity of these disclosures? How can we make them better so that investors can be uh, you know, more enlightened with the real facts and figures. David, you're nodding your head. Uh, yes, uh, nodding in agreement that it's a good question. Um, it, th th there's a degree of comparability uh, now in, in some ESG reporting, particularly around the data points. You know, many, many companies are using a broadly similar uh, approach to reporting. Uh, uh, in, in a number of markets, and yes, it's embryonic, but uh, uh, I've been working in this space for, for almost 20 years now, and so we've had a while uh, for these uh, uh, standards to evolve, and there's a degree of uh, harmonization at play at the moment. I think where the challenge is, is not around the comparability of the data points, it's around the narrative and the qualitative story that sits behind those data points. And so if you look at uh, if you look at a utilities company, you would get very comparable data points around uh, carbon intensity uh, of emissions, around SOX, around NOx and environmental impact. 
Uh, but what you really want is to go beyond that single data point of, of, of spot um, uh, uh, emissions figures, for example. What you want is uh, targets for managing those metrics, a strategy for managing those metrics. So where do you want to be? When do you want to be there? And how do you want to be there? How do you want to get there? Uh, what it means for your, your strategy and what the impact on your, your strategy and your financials might be. And so we're really at the early stage of reporting as much as we see uh, comparability around data uh, in many cases. So employee turnover, for example, turnover by gender, turnover by age. Uh, but what we don't tend to see comparability is, a, is around the strategic components of that, what the targets are, what the strategy is for reaching those targets. And I, I think that's where a lot more work tends to need to be done to communicate to investors uh, uh, what a company's sustainability strategy is. Thank you. Um, you know, related to disclosure, of course, is, you know, the very famous big sin, greenwashing. And in fact, we have a question from one of our online participants. How can shareholders identify a greenwashing company? How are you? You touch quite a fair bit about future proving products and yeah, so identifying various sectors. So I ask you. Well, uh, go down, kick the tires, right? And, and see for yourself. And challenge management at AGMs, you know, question them on, you know, what, what have they achieved? And, you know, and I think um, companies will know that shareholders are serious on this topic. There are also other ways, you know, companies can obtain assurance for the report. Um, I think it's a good way to start for companies who want to engender confidence in their disclosures and that their disclosures are consistent, accurate, and reliable. And for companies whose operations have large impact on the environment, companies may choose to go for reasonable assurance as opposed to a more limited assurance. So assurance is still a possibility. Yeah. So I think there, there are quite a few ways to go about it and not just... Uh, one, one way of finding out a company greenwashing. I, I think they're also environmentalists and such who will be doing part of that job. Roger, yes, yeah. Roger. I think it, you know, it, is, it, is very, it is very difficult. And um, ultimately though, you know, I, I would be looking for evidence to back up assertions which are being made by companies, you know, concrete evidence, but, Ultimately, um, I think we're going to have to turn to the audit profession um, to actually to start to up their game in the future to provide us with a much better level of assurance um, around around this kind of disclosure. Um, at the moment, they're not really set up to do that. They're still very much the profession is still very much focused on financial um, assurance and. I think, you know, there have been proposals in the UK to actually set up a new um, audit profession, which will have a much broader perspective than just focusing on financial matters and will have people qualifying within it who are experts on ESG type issues, uh, sustainability issues, the sort of skills that you need to, to, to look at these matters. Um, that ultimately is the way I think we're going to get uh, better, better assurance around greenwashing. Thank you. Well, I, I'm sure many of us have read, you know, suggestions, um, quite fairly widespread suggestions that companies should actually disclose a statement of purpose, either in their annual report or in their sustainability report, so that they can then, you know, be held accountable to shareholders on what they stand for and what they choose to do and how they intend to conduct themselves. What do you think uh, about this suggestion? I think it's a, it's a very good um, suggestion. I think, you know, having purpose, it's like it creates a kind of unifying principle for the company. Um, you know, uh, it's almost like the North Star of the company that can help them guide their um, their strategy um, and, and all of their activities and, and motivate their workforce as well. Um, but of course, they've got, uh, you know, a company has to walk the walk. And it's, 
um, shareholders, regulators, and other stakeholders, um, quite rightly, will be wanting to hold companies to, to account in respect of their corporate purpose. But I think increasingly it is demanded, you know, that a, I think a company has to show that it has a reason for being which goes above and beyond um, simply creating profit or dividends for shareholders and which, which fulfills a broader role. Thank you. Anyone else wants to weigh in on this? Statement of purpose, much like a mission, vision statement. Well, um, if I can just chime in, I think, I, well, the statement is a good idea. I think uh, the company has to show sincerity in action. So is there a board sustainability committee, uh, remunerations tied to sustainability uh, matrices, um, for example, in areas of uh, sourcing for resources, managing waste, CO2 emissions, and so forth. So um, statement, very good, but also, uh, you know, hard uh, commitments. Yeah, I, I would tend to share some of Hariel's scepticism, um, or maybe I'm just too sceptical, that I think ultimately what statements of purpose and intent are actually a good thing, uh, particularly galvanizing for employees. I think ultimately you will end up with too many lawyers looking at these statements and purpose, and you'll end up with fairly bland motherhood statements that, that can't be audited. Uh, and so, yes, good idea in, in theory, but we already have a lot of statements of purpose that are uh, 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 fairly all-encompassing, uh, uh, <laughs> I think. Emily, would, would you encourage any of your investee companies to actually develop such statements and, and actually uh, publish them? You, you're muted. Well, they can publish a statement. Right, but whether how 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 tightly do they follow the statement is another story. Okay, because like for example, one one very good example in Indonesia, the government is chasing after ESG, so they force all the listed companies to put five to ten percent of their profits every year for ESG goals. So what do these corporates do? They sponsor a marathon. Okay, they give some money to orphanage to old folks home, and they call it is that they have achieved their goal. So, so, so I'm also very skeptical whether a statement actually works. <laughs> okay, I, 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 hear, I hear all of you. We not only have to walk the talk, we have to walk the walk. Let's look at another question from um, our participants. There is a question on social, on, on geopolitical uh, developments. Uh, let me see. Yes. Okay. Major countries like Germany are turning to coal as a response to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So is it still possible on their claims that they are still on track for ESG if they focus more on the S and G and less on the E? In other words, a stronger S and G to counterbalance the E? Anyone wants to comment on that? Yeah, I think that is not is <laughs> just kind of deviating from the spirit of what we're trying to get at here, isn't it? You know, so um, to say, well, well, I don't have to do something down, I'll do something here instead. Uh -huh. You know, perhaps it is points to the risks, act of the risk of the concept of ESG, actually bringing these things together um, in one concept, because ultimately they all the, the E and the S and G are all in the, each independent and in, uh, important in their own right. Um, so, you know, it's not, I don't think one can pursue a, a mix and match strategy. Having said that, I do accept the, I suppose the, the implication of what the, the, the questioner is, is trying to get at here, and that is, um, you know, what actually should be regarded as a good ESG approach at any point in time, given the, given the context, the global context that, that, that we're in. And there is a big debate going on at the moment um, in terms of investing or um, providing finance actually to the fossil fuels business. Um, and different people are taking different lines on this. You know, there mm. is a quite a, a hard line approach which is being taken, which um, 
in particular, the, the, the UN initiative known as the Race to Zero initiative has taken earlier this, this year, which is to say that banks, for example, or other investors shouldn't invest in new capacity in the fossil fuel business. Um, and they, they have been demanding that people who sign up to their initiative um, sh shouldn't do that. Uh, but of course, other people, uh, the banks or a number of the banks, American banks in particular, um, have been saying, well, you know, that, that's too hard line a stance at the current time, given the en energy security issues which we're facing. And also what we need to do, what we want to do is invest in companies that are moving in the right direction um, and also companies that we can engage with on things like ESG, not those necessarily that are are the finished article already. Um, so that I think reflects a big debate in, in ESG about whether you just simply screen out and divest from any company that isn't perfect or whether actually um, ESG investing should be about going on a journey with a company um, and trying to encourage them to do the right thing um, over time. So I don't yeah, um, think to say you can do one rather than the other is a bit um, missing the point in terms of what ESG is trying to achieve. Anyone else wants to weigh in on this? Okay, if not, let me just move on. Now the OECD, I learned earlier on, earlier this week at the conference that uh, their place the management of climate change and other ESG risk on top of the list of their top 10 priority areas. And in fact, the OECD has just commenced public consultation on this G20 OECD principles of corporate governance. And uh, indeed, many other regulators in other markets similarly are in the process or have just completed uh, reviewing sustainability reporting and reporting requirements. So in, in the light of this, uh, I would like to ask, how should companies respond to these sweeping changes and new regulatory requirements? I know none, we don't have a company representative, but we do have ESG experts and industry watchers. I mean, I can go first and I'm sure others will, will comment as well, but I think it's very clear uh, that climate change is, is happening. The science uh, is, is very clear about this when you read the various reports. And so uh, I think we have to recognize that the climate is changing and that will have an impact on companies too, whether the company uh, likes it or not. And so I think it's incumbent on directors of, of companies and management teams of companies to understand what the impact on that company is, both in terms of physical uh, impacts, uh, uh, as well as uh, the, the, the indirect impacts uh, 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 around uh, social changes, consumer changes, uh, for example. Uh, and so the best companies will be the most resilient companies, will be the ones who recognize this, will be the ones that, 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 uh, that adapt uh, uh, to the changing climate. And so I, I think it's incumbent on, on management teams to recognize this and, and to communicate with their investors about this. Yes, Roger. Yes. I think uh, on the OECD principles, um, I mean, they of course are a very, that's a very influential um, set of principles in the world, in the global world of corporate governance, but it is primary, primarily um, focused on policy makers, you know, so it's it's there to guide governments in the development of their regulatory framework and, the, and their corporate governance codes and so on, rather than being something which is applied directly to companies. Um, but one, I, what, what I would point out um, in terms of regulatory developments really relates to this issue once again of the supply chain. Um, you know, there, there is significant regulatory change going on there which is increasingly demanding that companies have in place some kind of meaningful process to understand and manage their supply chain and understand what the 
um, you know, the, the carbon impact, the environmental impact of, of their supply chain is, as well as issues like um, labor exploitation um, and, and uh, human slavery and so on. And we, we're seeing various um, pieces of reg regulation coming forward. In France, they've had um, a, a duty of diligence, a vigilance, um, Vig sort of a duty of vigilance law in place now for a number of years. Um, a similar law is being implemented in Germany, which will, will take place, will be implemented next year. And the EU is, is developing its corporate sustainability due diligence directive, which also across the EU is going to require boards and companies to conduct due diligence of their of their supply chain so i think that's going to have ripple effects i think around the around the global economy so whether you are um you know a large corporate um that with a big supply chain or whether you are a company that that is part of a supply chain um uh, yourself so just you know understanding understanding that and being able to measure your carbon carbon fr footprint and uh, understand the externalities which you're generating, you know, uh, in terms of your activities. So I think that that's going to be a big change that will affect uh, global companies. Thank you, Roger. Well, we are aware that regulators, governments around the world are actually looking at ESG, as Roger has just very kindly outlined for us. Do you think the market infrastructure is ready for this. I mean, which comes first, regulations or infrastructure? Or is it a chicken and egg issue? We're talking about standards for comp uh, compare, uh, to compare the, the various metrics and, and scores. We're talking about processes, practices, um, you know, and, and so on. I mean, are we comparing apples with apples or just apples with pears? I, I, I wonder, uh, Lynn, could you just clarify when you say infrastructure, what, what, uh, are, well, you, are you thinking well, about what's present in companies themselves or? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm actually going down the value chain at the company level, right? When companies make disclosure, shareholders take it that it's Correct, but because this whole ESG revolution is so new, there are many standards, well, narrowed down to a handful, but there are still different standards. So you can have the same type of companies, the same type of companies in the same sector in different markets reporting differently. Or you can have uh, different uh, sectors again reporting differently. So how do we compare? I I do think we're still in this is I slightly immature phase of, of this whole process, um, whereby you know there there are so many NGOs, there are so many voluntary standards that are being used. Um, it's as, as we discussed, you know, there's a lack of consistency and we're, we're going through a process, I suppose, of move, moving from all, all the sort of potpourri of voluntary standards to, to, you know, ultimately the definition of a more consistent standardized approach. Um, and then on top of that, although there's been an explosion in the job market, you know, for ESG specialists, um, they, there's still a real shortage of, of people with that, that skill set. And you know, not enough boards of directors, not enough companies and investors, I think, have, have and I mentioned auditors a bit earlier on, um, you know, have the right skills and the right expertise to really um, address all of these issues. So um, I, do, I do think we, we, we've got a, a long way to go before we, we, we're fully kind of coping with this uh, ESG orientation. Well, these are the, some of the many challenges different stakeholders face. We, I've just seen, uh, I just see an, an interesting question from another participant. If ESG is so important, so there should be a stronger call 
for ESG performance to be tagged to senior management compensation and director's fees, much like business and financial performance. So tagging ESG performance in addition to financial and business performance for compensation. I'm happy to comment on that, but I'm aware that Harry had his hand up for the last comment. I don't know if you want to, 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 to comment on that before we move on, Harry. No, I was so going to comment, comment on the previous one, actually. Uh, but I think that it does perhaps make a segue into this one. Um, first, is there a global standard? And if there is, then it's much easier. If not, the companies can still pick and choose what they choose to disclose and they can choose what they choose to have assurances on. Um, there is still no global standard, uh, though many use global reporting initiative, GRI framework. And there's also a TCFD, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, but that is pertaining to only climate information. Um, there's also confusion about, I think, Dr. Smith mentioned what is sustainability, ESG, net zero, mean, mean different things to different people and different uh, rating agencies. I'm also sure there'll be eventually a, a set of robust global standards. International Sustainability Standards Board has issued a draft uh, standards on sustainability and climate related disclosure. So I think we are working towards it. And Dr. Barker said, we're kind of in an immature stage, but matter of time. Uh, whether we can, uh, that doesn't mean companies can't do anything until then, um, they can, definitely uh, choose their own matrices and tie remuneration to it. Um, not necessarily it has to be tied to, to, the, to the global standards, uh, though eventually may transition to that. Anybody else wants to comment on this? I think we are already seeing this, to be honest, in terms of incorporating ESG uh, uh, metrics or targets into executive compensation. This is primarily being through um, annual bonuses or short-term incentive plans rather than long-term incentive scans in plans and has tended to be as a component of, 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 of what's referred to as a balanced scorecard. So a number of factors which an executive or an executive team must meet before eligibility for, for an annual compensation. I think the challenge around this is in crafting this in a thoughtful way so that we are not incentivizing something that a management team should be doing through the normal course of business. So you shouldn't be getting a bonus uh, for not having a material negative environmental impact, for example, that should be a, a given. You should instead have a, have a gateway uh, so that you're eligible for, for a bonus, assuming you haven't, uh, 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 there's been uh, no big material environmental or special impact. So it has to be done thoughtfully, but I think it, it's already happening. Part of the challenge is around the metrics uh, uh, and the way we, we manage to this. But then uh, for those of us that have been looking at executive compensation uh, uh, for a number of times, the metrics around comp have always been complex, frankly, and, and open to, to management by, by management. Uh, and so that's part of the course, but that complexity doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't do it. Thank you. I, I would just ask a last question before I invite the panelists to, you know, just make some concluding remarks and share with us their last nuggets of wisdom for all of us. Uh, we, we are talking about, you know, different standards. We're talking about uh, the, the, it being immature. We also are talking about different stakeholders. Do you have any suggestions on how the various stakeholders can work together to make ESG effective in every sense of the word to make our world a better place. Okay. I think um, I think this is a actually touching, I think, here on a very um, important point, which is which has arisen in, in the UK where I'm based. Um, and that is that there is there is almost like a, a bit of a, a conflict between what directors perceive as their as their fiduciary duty, which is primarily to shareholders, um, and the development of this uh, you know a more this ESG perspective, which is which is about impact on a wider group of stakeholders, you know, in, including employees. So 
one of the one of the arguments has been actually that, that company law should be reformed so that directors um, should have legal duties which are more which are less should we say shareholder oriented and and, and have more more of a of a, of a broader stakeholder orientation um so that but i think though that in the absence of that more more sort of underlying um legal change any any good company as we've discussed you know any good company is well it will just as a matter of um of interest that the long-term interest of shareholders will, will be wanting to think about um a broader group of stakeholders and uh what we've seen increasingly in the UK are different ways of engaging with employees in particular um, in order to bring the employee voice into the into the boardroom more. Um, and one one method is to set up some kind of workforce advisory council, uh, which a number of companies have, have, have done, which provides advice, has no decision making power, but provides um, you know, input and perspectives to, to the board. Um, another um, a more radical solution, which some large UK companies have, have, have followed, is to have worker directors, you know, pe um, employees actually sitting on the board. And that, as we know, that is that sort of um, thing is quite common in continental Europe and countries like Germany, where on where on supervisory boards you do have employee directors. Um, not many companies have done that so far, but but it is. Uh, something that's possible. And then a final alternative um, is that um, increasingly we see that um, an, one of the non-executive directors on a board is given responsibility for um, connecting with the employee voice and um, have, having meetings with employee representatives so that they can understand them better and bring that perspective in, into boardroom discussions. So. Those are those are three ways of, of, of trying to um, understand the employee stakeholder group. Thank you, Roger. That's a very interesting perspective. Having, you know, engaging employees and bringing employees to the boardroom. Um, we talked about companies. We talked about regulators. We talked about employees. What about investors, both retail and institutions? I know how you. Yes. Sorry. I think uh, yeah. I, I think uh, probably um, institutional investors. I think most governments watchers would probably say that institutional investors have a strong voice. You know, they do as, as part of their their business. I'm, I, I'm. I wonder if David can confirm this. That you know that they are engaging with companies. They're engaging with boards. That's part. Of that's business. Business as usual. Of course, getting the retail shareholder perspective um, into companies is a, is, a, is more of a challenge. And historically, it's been the annual general meeting, you know, which has been the opportunity for for, for them to to have their express their voice, um, which is perfectly legitimate. You know, sometimes it makes it uncomfortable for for, for um, directors and for boards. So, um, we, we mustn't lose the voice of retail shareholders. I, I think just to, to comment on what Roger was, was suggesting, I think most, if not all, institutional investors are having this kind of engagement around uh, resilience, including climate resilience, but across the whole spectrum of ESG factors. And I think that speaks to your question, Elaine, around stakeholders needing to work together. We've got a big challenge ahead of us. And I think it's important that companies work with their suppliers, work with their investors, work with their employees, work with their customers in many cases. Uh, in order to in order to affect that change, you can't do this. You're alone. And so, as investors, uh, we're we're pleased to play a role in that. Thank you, uh, Howia. Would you like to comment from the retail perspective? Sure. Of course, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the sustainability report is uh, something very new for investors to go through, and many may not. I mean, uh, many don't even look at the annual report, much less a sustainability report. But I have been at AGMs where retail investors actually ask questions from the report. And interestingly, the first time I heard a question was probably about uh, diversity of the staff, gender diversity. And uh, the chair of the meeting just looked at it and went, actually, we never looked at in, into the, any of this. <laughs> so, you know, they probably got the report prepared and they just attacked and sent it off, right? And they were not prepared to answer questions about it. Uh, of course, that was the early days. Um, also, now that CRS has announced that we will be going through sustainability reports and 
hopefully asking hard questions. Um, so companies will have to pay more attention and not, not just use uh, you know, consultants to prepare reports, but really the boards have to spend time on it as well. Well, I, I did say that that was the last question, but I've just seen one very interesting question. I think we must address this. The earlier study mentioned a long-term premium on ESG. So how much of this ESG is priced in by the market, especially for ESG index components? David, you want to take this one? Uh, I still think the market for ESG is relatively inefficient. Um, so I think uh, there's evidence that ESG outperforms, uh, as the question alludes to. But I think for many of the reasons that I mentioned earlier, the market is still relatively inefficient. There are very high quality companies who are not disclosing very well. Uh, there are investors that, that don't have the capacity, capability or time horizon to integrate ESG. And so there's still an opportunity uh, for, for investors to do their homework, identify these companies and invest in these companies. That sounds like a plug for active management, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's a comment on the, uh, the inefficiencies of the market. Yeah. Emily, you have some views about this question? You're muted. Well, yeah, I think a lot of it is also the perception of the listed company. How do they, how do their kind of investor relations, how do they tell people they are ESG? Right, so, so this perception will actually help them with the uh, higher uh, premium on the share price. That's what I think. Thank you. I think time's running on. I would just ask each panelist to, if they have any last words to share with the participants before we bring this session to a close. So since Emily are with me now, would you like to have to share any last words of wisdom with our participants? Sure. Okay. So, so for investments, we, we build it from the ground up. So, so we start the companies from scratch and we started with ESG. So, so our situation is different from companies that are already in operation and trying to add ESG to their operations. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and from, from this perspective, actually the ESG cost, cost of the ESG is already priced in. All right. Mm. How young? I think as, as with many of these initiatives, tone from the top is very important. The, it, do the companies have ESG on their board agendas? You know, their board meets a few times a year. Is there a dashboard of your targets and how you're performing according to those targets? I mean, if the board shows that they're serious, it will trickle down to management and the rest of the company. And please also communicate this and give updates along the way. And then the retail shareholders, as you asked earlier, will also be interested and follow this. Thank you. Thank you, I, I, I hear you. The key is engagement, right? Roger. Yes, I think um, I, you know, I, I just agree with, with that comment, especially as I was speaking from the Institute of Directors. You know, I think that the board of directors is, is key to this. And, and David was, has been talking a lot about how how difficult and challenging it can be to, you know, to, to understand really is there genuine commitment to, to ESG at a company? Well, ultimately, if you go along to an AGM and ask a question of the directors, just simple questions, um, you know, what's your carbon footprint? How's your business model going to be affected by climate change? What, how, how are you measuring and, tar and targeting um, ESG type factors. Put those questions, listen to the answers. And if you're not convinced, then that probably is the, the best bit of evidence you can get. Thank you. Well, we started with you, David, so I kept you for the last. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, uh, I, I, I sometimes feel sorry for, for directors and management teams on these kind of calls because we have a we have a tendency to overcomplicate things by talking about the intricacies of scoring, the intricacies of stock price correlations and so on and so forth. I think ultimately what we're talking about is, is relatively simple. Uh, and I would, I would uh, uh, suggest management teams and, di and directors focus on this simplicity, uh, cut out the noise and really focus on the long-term resilience of your business. What are the shocks? What are the changes that you're susceptible to? 
ultimately what could go wrong in your business model uh, uh, and then focus on those kind of issues as they relate to ESG. I think what's, what's also worth pointing out is that many management teams are already doing this without recognizing necessarily that it is quote unquote ESG as well. So don't get distracted by the noise. Don't get distracted by the complexity of what people sometimes talk about, myself included, uh, and, and, and get cracking because this is super important. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it only leaves me to thank all our panelists for making time, for preparing and for joining us for the last one and a half hours, sharing with us what they have learned in the course of their work uh, on ESG uh, in this, what I call the new green revolution. So thank you very much panelists, thank you. David, Roger, Hao Yao, Emily, and I must also thank all of you who have signed on and stayed with us on a Friday night for one and a half hours. Thank you very much. And of course, I must thank Sias for putting this together and for organizing it for all of us. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. We have come to the end of the forum and the end of the Corporate Governance Week 2022. So to all the attendees and all the speakers, um, some of you are here with us and those who are, you know, maybe logging in remotely, we would like to just thank you once again uh, for your support. So before we end the session, uh, if we can kindly seek the attendees' help to fill in the feedback form as you exit the webinar. And also there's a QR code on screen to join Sia's mailing list if you wish to stay in touch with us and receive more information from Sia's. So thank you once again. And on behalf of all of us at Sia's, we look forward to seeing you at the next Corporate Governance Week 2023. Wishing you a good evening and a splendid weekend ahead. Good night, everyone. <laughs>